All right. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Welcome. Come on in. Uh, we'll be starting in just a minute. Just want to make sure that everyone's devices can get in. Oh, yeah, it's like streaming in now. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. We will begin in just a moment. So get nice and comfy. Get your beers if you have them. If you yes. have them. Not if a requirement, you, but if you have them, certainly now is the time. Okay, it looks like the number slowed down just a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with the introduction. And then as people come in, they'll, they'll jump right in. All right. So hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight for Drinking Games in History with Lucas Livingston. Uh, my name is Megan, and I'm the Programs and Exhibits Supervisor at the Arlington Heights Memorial Library. And I am joined today by my colleague, Allison. Um, first of all, thank you to Beer on the Wall for assembling and uh, the suggested sips and ordering specifically for this amazing presentation. For more programs um, to keep you entertained and informed, uh, please visit our programs calendar at ahml.info. And now I'm going to pass it on over to Allison, who will be introducing tonight's speaker. All right, well, our speaker tonight is Lucas Livingston. Lucas is an art historian focusing on humanity's history of visual expression filtered through the pint glass. During his two decade tenure as an educator and director of lifelong learning with the Art Institute of Chicago, his passion for antiquity led him down the rabbit hole of beer history and experimental home brewing, strictly for research, of course. He has lectured on the art history of beer and wine for the Art Institute, Field Museum, University of Chicago, NYU, University of Hawaii, and the Chicago Museum, where he, is, where he also serves on the board of directors. An antiquarian at heart, he received degrees in ancient Mediterranean civilizations from Notre Dame and the University of Chicago, studied Egyptology at the American University in Cairo, and has led international learning adventures in Egypt, Jordan, Greece, Turkey, and India. And not to be one-upped by the pace of technology, he is also the creator and host of the Ancient Art Podcast at ancientartpodcast.org. And just for fun, Lucas is a published author in peer-reviewed journals and a sought-after consultant on the intersections of museums, disability, aging, and public health. His articles, conference sessions, and webinars are available through his academia page at lucaslivingston.com. And with that, Lucas, I will turn things over to you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Allison, and thank you, Megan, and Arlington Heights Memorial Library for asking me here today and uh, uh, I'm, I'm really delighted. Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, looking forward to <clears throat> spending this hour with you here. And uh, yeah, as was said, uh, use that that chat box. I already see there's a lot of good good uh, chat going on in there. Um, that is our our pub for this hour, our, our bar room, our tavern hall, our, our uh, wine uh, bar. So so hang out in there and um, yeah, and I, I guess we have the, the Q&A box if that's where you wanna ask, uh, queue up any questions separate from the chat, but we'll also try to keep tabs on any questions that happen up in the, in the chat box as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, and, and uh, as was so kindly mentioned already, uh, a number of my, my pursuits, uh, academic uh, and, uh, uh, as well as hobby, the, and uh, they, uh, a lot of that's on screen here, and you can follow me on all the, the social medias and such, um, so check those out. Maybe the easiest way to, to find me on, uh, online is just head on over to uh, ancientartpodcast.org, and that's um, where you'll find a whole bunch of episodes. I think I'm at 93 episodes now uh, kind of slowed down a little bit in the last couple of years, um, though I've been doing a lot more live stream events uh, with a number of uh, organizations instead of the, the podcast format in the last uh, year or two, really. 
So uh, head on over there and check that out. As was also mentioned, yeah, with the Chicago Bruseum. Some of you might be familiar with that. Um, that is a um, wonderful organization. We just celebrated our fifth year anniversary. Uh, and the Chicago Bruseum is the nation's first 501c3 nonprofit organization museum dedicated to exploring beers, as I like to say, beer centrality in the human existence over uh, 10,000 years or so. And uh, I very much skew very more towards uh, antiquity. Uh, I joke anything after Cleopatra's current events, uh, as far as I'm concerned. So, um, but uh, really the, the Bruseum explores the whole corpus of, of beer. And it's not just a bunch of people getting together drinking. Uh, the, 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 the motto uh, uh, mission in the, within the mission statement of the Bruseum is uh, beer is more than just a beverage. You know, it's a dynamic cultural force with the power to bring people together and the ability to influence change. And we're gonna see a lot of that this hour exploring drinking games. We're not just gonna, not just going to have fun looking at drinking games, but we're going to explore how drinking games are very much a, a, a manifestation of that as, aspects within human culture around the world, across the globe, and, and spanning all uh, eons of human existence. Other things for you to check out, uh, if you go to YouTube, uh, I uh, am the co-host of Uncorked YouTube series with Archaeology Now. That's been a more recent development, a number of uh, episodes exploring uh, um, aspects of, in the history of, of drinking uh, and, and wine and beer and all forms of alcoholic indulgence uh, from an archaeological perspective. And uh, for kicks, <laughs> um, I blog about beer at morgbrewing.com. That's my personal vanity homebrew. I've been brewing since 2012 and got into that. People uh, ask me, how'd you get into that? And uh, well, you know, a lot of times people are asking me these questions. I used to work at the Art Institute of Chicago for almost 20 years, uh, giving tours uh, of e ancient Egyptian funerary reliefs depicting feasting for eternity and ancient Greek uh, drinking vessels. And, and we'll explore some of that. And then uh, people ask me these questions like, well, did the Egyptians uh, malt their barley? I'm scratching my head. I'm like, uh, I'll look into that. Uh, um, and then asking, well, was, was ancient uh, Greek wine spontaneously fermented or did they inoculate it with yeast? And I'm like, uh, well, what's, what's yeast? <laughs> so I did some more digging and discovered, oh my gosh, you can make this stuff at home. So I went down that, uh, down, down that rabbit hole pretty pretty fast. So I've been trying to recreate a lot of uh, uh, ancient and uh, historic beers from uh, antiquity through uh, even more modernity, uh, but certainly with a bit of a, a bent towards, uh, towards the ancient world. As was mentioned at the top of the hour, uh, and this is not just uh, uh, not just an interesting conversation about uh, beer and wine and such, but uh, yeah, it's also a uh, uh, well participatory. And you know, we're all, we were only looking at half of that flyer there. We have uh, all these beverages, so I don't know if you've got yours. I've got mine. Um, so we do have a few beers to drink, and yeah, uh, my my thanks to uh, to the library as well as to um, to, to beer on the wall for helping me put together this, this great carefully selected list uh, of beverages that each one's been chosen to tie in with our narrative uh, this, this evening. So first up, we go to ancient Greece and we're gonna crack open that uh, lake effect uh, um, uh, barrel aged gosa. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, participate uh, along because uh, just because you know we just we got to do it that way. Um, so <laughs> this uh, this beer here um, and uh, well well I'll I'll show a few more slides and then I'll talk a bit more about the beer. Um, but this is I like to say uh, talking about ancient Greece. This is a beer for wine drinkers. Um, so if you're if you're you know, a little hesitant about beer, then um, go to this is a great beverage to to check out uh, if you're interested uh, in, in in and want to onboard into that. I always like to say you know people say oh I'm not really a beer fan, 
well, that's, there's a beer out there for everybody that you just not had the right one. <laughs> so, um, but let's go back to the art and the culture and segue into drinking games here. This is a wonderful piece from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, which kind of sets our stage here. There's a passage from Homer's Odyssey uh, composed who knows when, but first written down around 600 BC. And in this one passage, so Odysseus and his men, they crash land on the island of Circe, the witch queen, if you want to call her that and uh, and so then uh, they, they they some they head their way into towards this smoke in the distance and within this island jungle dense for, forested jungle and they happen upon all these ferocious beasts but they're very docile like jaguars and such but just docile looking at them and uh, and then they come upon this this hut and there um and then Circe welcomes them all inside and mixes for them a, a potion, as the translations often say, a potion with barley and cheese and pale honey added to Pramnian wine. And but she put into the mixture some malignant drugs to make them forgetful of their own country. And when they'd given, when she'd given them this and they drunk it down, next she struck them with her wand and drove them into her pig pens. And they took on the looks of pigs with the heads and the voices and bristles of pigs, but the minds within them had stayed as before. So this kind of uh, spooky Shakespearean witchcraft or sorcery of Grimm's fairy tales, probably a favorite among those doe-eyed children millennia ago, <laughs> bed night, a bedtime story. But what's neat is you read it closely and Homer is actually giving us a recipe for a type of drink that they drank that uh, two almost 3,000 years ago, this mixture of barley, uh, honey, and wine, uh, and, and some cheese actually um, grated into that, um, and so which is kind of interesting. We think of pairing wine and cheese, and uh, or or even a craft beer and cheese, and um, they but they you know they all go in the same mouth. So why not just mix them together in one bite or one draught? <laughs> so. Actually, also in the Iliad, there's another similar recipe, uh, the description of Nestor's cup, uh, where it says that the woman as fair as a goddess mixed them a mess with Pramnian wine and she grated goat's milk cheese into it with a bronze grater, threw in a handful of barley meal and having thus prepared the, the mess, she bade them to drink. So and then you scratch your head, okay, a few times they're talking about this mixture of, of barley and honey and wine and were they, uh, was this, something they were actually drinking back then. And yes, there's some corroborating evidence from the um, tomb of the Phrygian, originally attributed to the Phrygian king Midas, you know, Midas, he of the golden touch, right? That legendary, semi-legendary king, but there was actually somebody named that um, from around the year, was that around the year 700 BC, I think that was. So right around the same time when Homer is putting pen to paper, if there ever even was a Homer. That's a whole nother story. Uh, but now it's attributed not to Midas, but his father, Gordius. And uh, in the 1950s, it was excavated. And you see uh, in uh, the, this, the, the images at left of the artifacts that were found. And then this wonderful uh, illustration at right that depicts the, the fanciful sort of uh, rendering of the funerary feast of, uh, of King Gordius. Uh, but residue analysis, micro residue analysis of these uh, vessels at left, you scrape a little bit of the dregs, dried dregs off, and you can put it through a mass spectrometer and figure out the chemical elements, signatures of what, what was basically in the ingredients of what this desiccated remains are. And they found, interestingly, these signature characteristics of uh, of a fermented barley beer, something called uh, calcium oxalate is a, a byproduct of, of, of fermented barley. Uh, brewers call it beer stone. And uh, they also found some honey uh, beeswax, so which suggests there was honey in there fermented as mead. And then they found tartaric acid, which is the, a byproduct of uh, fermented grapes. And so you've got this mixture of beer, mead, and grapes all together. Uh, um, so very similar to what uh, Homer was talking about. So it's kind of interesting. 
And uh, some of you might be pretty familiar with uh, this uh, project through the dog, Delaware-based Dogfish Head uh, Brewery and uh, Dr. Patrick McGovern, uh, University of Pennsylvania archeologist, sometimes referred to as the Indiana Jones of beer. <laughs> and uh, they did a collaboration on a whole bunch of different beverages, uh, re recreating these ancient ales. The most famous one is Midas Touch, so, which is based on this, this residue that they found. And it's not commercially available presently uh, at the moment, but um, you might still be able to find a few dusty bottles in, <laughs> on the back shelves of some liquor stores. Uh, I myself also uh, looking at uh, Homer's Odyssey and the Iliad and some of the archaeological evidence and such, uh, try to recreate some of these beverages. And so I came up with Circe's Elixir. <laughs> and, you know, and as an art historian, I can't just come up with a beer. I got to put a whole backstory into it and create a, a, a lovely label as well with artistry and such. And so, so these are some of the labels I've got there. Uh, you can scan the QR code if you want to check in on Untapped, but then I'll have to send you some beer so you can legitimately check in and not just fib. But this takes us now though to uh, our, uh, back to our our beer here, this Golsa. So I'll talk a little bit about each of these beers, the style, the origin of the style, why we chose this beverage, how it fits into what we're looking at. The Golsa actually is a, um, it's a, it's a German style that originated in the city of Goslar. That's where the name comes from, Golsa, which is in Northern Germany between uh, Hanover and Leipzig, um, but it's a wheat beer. And so that means 50% roughly barley, 50% wheat. Uh, and and so, but also an ale fermented with ale yeast, if any that matters to any of you out there. So, uh, which is interesting because Germany is so well known for its light uh, lagers, like the Helles and the Pilsner and such. The, but uh, ales is a very different type of beer that's a little more you might associate that more with, like England and such. But Germany has a tradition of a few ales. Uh, so, but then take a sip of our beer here and. First thing, well, first you want to smell it and you also want to look at it too and get yourself a nice clean glass. If you see a lot of bubbles on the side of your glass when you pour a beer into it, uh, that means you have a dirty glass. So you want to make sure your glass is nice and clean, but not smelling like soap. You may, if you do use dish soap, make sure to wash it out, very rinse it very thoroughly. Um, and, uh, you know, and a lot of people say you don't never want to use dish soap on your drinkware because uh, it, it ruins the 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 head and such of of uh, of, of your beer but uh, but i use dish soap and just to make sure you thoroughly rinse it um, and and preferably use an unscented soap uh, all this information you didn't think you you were going to get tonight but uh, but this has definitely a wonderful grape wine bouquet to it as well as a bit of a nice tartness from the lactobacillus bacteria that's uh, it's okay. It's not harmful. You think bacteria, no, but this is um, typical of well, lactic lactobacillus bacteria is what actually spoils milk when it goes sour. It turns uh, the turns the the sugars or alcohols really into uh, lactic acid, and so that's the the tartness that we're getting. Um, it's different from vinegar. That's acetic acid, a totally different kind of acid, but they're very similar. Lactic acid can quickly turn into acetic acid if it gets exposed to too much oxygen. Uh, things you have to learn as a brewer. <laughs> it's rather similar to um, Berliner Weisse in that regards and kind of comes from a similar region up in the north. But I think this is a nice nod to antiquity because this is a time uh, when uh, well before the use of hops. Hops weren't used in beer until around uh, uh, the year 1000 or so of, of the common era. So whereas we have 10,000 years of beer brewing. And so for a long time, beer was being made uh, before hops. Um, and so all these ancient beers were without hops. Something like a Golsa or Bolino Weisse are, uh, have next to no hops in them. What you see on screen here, it says 4.8% alcohol by volume volume and IBU, that's the uh, International Bittering Units. It's a, it's a, 
a, a way to measure how bitter something is, but it was just made up basically by, by brewers. Uh, and this is one. And uh, your typical American IPA will be a bitterness in the range of, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, anything above like 70 or 80. Human taste buds just can't really discern uh, any extreme level of bitterness beyond, I think, 80 is what uh, uh, is, is the current maybe thinking. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so uh, this is a very non bitter beer in that sense. So a little bit of a nice nod to that uh, antiquity. About the Lake Effect Barrel Age project, the series that they're doing is uh, they take basically, uh, as your can I think might tell you, they, they take the same base beer, but then they'll age batches in different barrels um, to, to see what comes out. And this was aged in uh, Madeira barrel, as uh, we see on screen here, um, which is a type of fortified wine from uh, Spain and Portugal, that region. Um, so in that sense, it, it's not it's not a true uh, beer wine hybrid, um, but it aged in the barrels gives it that strong uh, whininess, which is about as close as we're going to get right now with what's commercially available to uh, a, a Eno beer. An Eno beer is a fancy word for uh, these beer wine hybrids. Um, so, but yeah, it's, it's, a, I, I, I like it. It's a great beer. So, but moving away from those earlier Bronze Age wine beers straight to the wine culture of, of classical Athens, these elite 1% um, snooty aristocratic parties ancient Greek drinking parties. They had a name for the, these drinking parties in ancient Greece, and they were uh, really popular, called the symposium. <laughs> you might chuckle and think of a symposium, you know, a bunch of professors getting together, reading some papers, having a little wine and cheese maybe or such. You know, in ancient Greece in the symposium, they'd skip the papers. They'd go straight to the wine. Oh, they'd have a little bit of food and such. But you see, this is a lot of... Uh, these, these um, middle-aged men reclining on couches with servants and attendants and slaves at their beck and call, exclusively a men's club thing. But, you know, the women on screen are, of course, courtesans or sometimes musicians. There was something not for a respectable woman to attend the symposium. Uh, the ancient Greek word symposion is where the word symposium comes from. And it's a fun word. You, you think of what the uh, origin of the word is. It comes from sim, like symmetry, meaning together, and posion is a drinker. So it's quite literally a gathering of drinkers. <laughs> That's what a symposium is. So next time you have a symposium, you say, wait, you're doing it all wrong. Start with the wine. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, they could certainly become a little bit of these these raucous types of affairs with a lot of uh, of of mm, well overindulgence in a sense, uh, and so sometimes that's even depicted on these ancient Greek drinking cups. This this round image is on the interior of a dr drinking cup. We'll take a look at these types of, uh, of, of cups as well. Even Socrates would overindulge as well, as we learned from the first paragraph of Plato's Symposium. He wrote a book, Plato wrote a book called The Symposium. And it starts off basically everybody's saying, all right, Socrates and all of his, his wealthy friends are hanging around saying, okay, well, we're too hungover from last night. So let's, let's just talk tonight instead of drinking. <laughs> So, but onto the drinking games, they definitely love to gamify their uh, their drinking parties. And I think this is something we're going to see throughout this this hour, or we have only about half an hour left of, of uh, the types of drinking games, uh, how uh, drinking is fundamentally drinking culture is a time when you come together for camaraderie, but often there's more to it. One popular game in ancient Greece was called kotabos, and you had take a kylix, that's the type, the shape of drinking cup, this kylix here, drinking vessel, and uh, uh, it's so it's it's like a bowl, but uh, uh, but this is the kind of cup you'll be drinking from earlier on in the symposium before you have had too much, so you're not going to spill all over yourself. A very shallow, very uh, uh, low, shallow type of drinking vessel. I've got a uh, let's see, I want to pop open. There was sometimes uh, we we wonder how how effectively easily can one play this game? The idea is you will 
you'll stick your finger through one of these handles with a little bit of residue left in your drinking cup. You'll twirl the cup around and fling the dregs out to try to strike some sort of a, a target in the center of a room, whether it's a, a jug or a, a delicate plates dangling from a, a balanced on stands or something or a poor flute girl or something like that. So kotobos was an ancient Greek drinking game. There's um, this fun paper, I think you can find it on uh, on where is that? I think on academia somewhere, but uh, Heather Sharp and Andrew Snyder produced, uh, trying to recreate uh, using uh, ceramic and 3D printed replica vessels, trying to uh, explore <laughs> using uh, uh, brave grad students, trying to explore uh, what's the ideal size of a, a Kylix vessel for producing uh, or for effectively doing the, the Kota Boss game. Um, so yeah, you can, you can find that on your own time or on the handout has the link at the bottom here. Um, but so looking at different Kylix vessels, again, for further kind of gamification of drinking culture on the underside of a lot of these vessels, they have these great big eyes glaring out, painted eyes. Uh, so as you are holding it up to your mouth, I got a vocal cat in the background, pardon me. You know, again, this is our Zoom life. Uh, as you hold the cup up to your eye, up to your mouth, taking a drink, all of your friends gather around, look at you, and you have seemed to don this, this monstrous mass, great big bulging eyes, the stem becomes the snout, the handles become ears. You are like the, the swine from that passage in the Odyssey when Circe turned Odysseus's men into pigs uh, from, from drinking. So... <laughs> Then, and I just show you the interior of the so-called Dionysus cup at the top here uh, is uh, just a very famous cup from ancient Greece and has a, a beautiful picture of Dionysus on the interior. But probably hands down my favorite drinking vessel from the ancient Greek world is this one in the Art Institute's collection. Something I became very very intimately familiar with over the years. This type of deep well drinking mug is called a Rhyton, R-H-Y-T-O-N. You see that on screen. It's a very ancient type of drinking vessel. Already at this time, 480 BC, it was uh, already considered an ancient style of vessel that people have been drinking out of for a thousand years from the ancient Near East, what's today the Middle East. And we find it even all the way over in China. It's, it started in, the, in Central Asia, the ancient Near East, Mesopotamia, and spread eastward and westward. Looking at this, you're probably asking yourself, how do you set it down? right? <laughs> there's, there's no easy way to set it down. So how are you going to drink from it too? Yeah, I think if you try to drink normally, that ear might get in the way and, uh, and, and you'll maybe dribble on yourself. So you could probably grab it on upside down, but my money's more on, you might slip your thumb through that handle and you see this lovely little, um, this lovely little, uh, what do you call that, a raised ridge on the top there. And if you put your thumb through the handle, this becomes a perfect finger rests, this ridge. So you're grasping this mug, knocking it back. And then it, in essence, like those cups with the eyes, you, you become a, an ass through drinking. You put up this big donkey face. So there's this actual corroborating passage from Aristophanes' play, The Wasps, where one character quips uh, something uh, about saying, I, I brought this long-eared jar full of wine, how it brays when I bend back and bury its neck into my mouth. So a lot of interesting, fun, uh, fun uh, ideas about alcohol having this magical effect to transform you into beasts, into donkeys, into asses, and into, into pigs and such. I mean, probably that says a little something. You become an ass or a pig when you overindulge a little too much. Uh, so uh, here, for example, uh, you, if, if you're interested in delving a little bit more into uh, that, I wrote a paper on this whole uh, thing about uh, overindulgence and intoxication and metamorphosis and such. A lot uh, further along the lines of the kind of the gamification of drinking uh, is a lot of these right on vessels, the metal ones especially, have holes in the bottom. You see on this one, there's a little hole. And if you hold it up high, the wine pours through the spout. You fill it from the top and then it pours this funnel effects, geyser shooting out. Certainly this was meant for some 
ritualistic purposes, libations and so on, uh, religious practice and what, but hands down, my money's also on that somebody was playing games with these, uh, with these vessels, holding it high. A lot of these games have to do with trying not to spill on yourself, holding it high and letting a stream of wine flow into your mouth. There's no name for this game like Kotabos we had, but you know people were doing this. Much like today, you find that very familiar thing, the Spanish poron, style of vessel. The poron is a similar drinking game in a sense where uh, you usually they use white wine in case you're definitely going to spill on yourself with this, but, uh, uh, and you hold it high up. And the idea is first starting uh, right close to your mouth and then get further and further away and see how far you can get uh, without spilling on yourself. It's a fun thing to do with friends. It always involves friends. You never, it's not, there's no solitaire drinking game here. It's all about community, right? Alcohol's power to to bring us together and, and establish camaraderie. So uh, lots of fun there. Um, I don't know if these map, the, oh yeah, they, hey, look at that. We're gonna, we're gonna leave ancient Greece now and spend some time in China, <laughs> ancient China. And uh, uh, actually moving on then, why don't we move on to our next beverage? If, you know, if you, if you jump the gun and you already crack open the next beverage, you know, that's okay. You're not gonna lose points here, but, um, now we're moving, and this is interesting, to Sun and Steel. Sun and Steel is um, part of a series of beers that were, um, are continued to be produced by Robinson's Brewery out of England. And you think, okay, China, what's going on here? And also you look on screen and it's very much uh, not uh, Chinese, but rather it's, it's a Japanese inspired uh, beverage. Sun and Steel, it's um, a collaboration with the, the band, heavy metal bands, uh, world's greatest band, Iron Maiden, and, uh, and Robinson's Brewery. Uh, and this interesting one, though, Sun and Steel, is, it, it's, uh, is so it's a tr very traditional style of uh, simple uh, Pilsner beverage, but brewed also with sake yeast. Uh, and so that gives it a, an interesting character that you may not find in other types of Pilsners, the sake uh, quality to it. It's not uh, not quite, and there might be a little hint of some uh, uh, umami type of flavor to it, perhaps, uh, that you might get very much from that you get this sort of slickness when you drink some sake, uh, though, but that comes from a process, the mold sacrification process. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, so, and so, and even though we're talking about China, I'll circle back to um, the reason why we chose chose this uh, this this um, sort of pseudo Japanese beer here. <laughs> um, so, but this is uh, typical of ancient China. These uh, grand aristocratic funerary feasts with these bronze vessels. Uh, as sacrifices to one's ancestors, and at the in the in despite it being a highly uh, ritualized and very solemn spiritual process, it was also a time when people would come together for communal feasting, merriment, celebrating one's ancestors, a um, surviving relative of the ancestor who's being celebrated at this feast was designated as a spiritual medium, basically, to connect with the, the, the deceased spirits. Uh, and we're talking, this is like um, 3,500 years ago in, in ancient China. And at a certain moment during, after a few days of fasting, the this uh, descendant spiritual medium was, uh, um, was was uh, required to drink nine goblets of a type of fermented beverage, these big goblets here. And so this uh, certainly would put them in kind of this altered, <laughs> intoxicated state to, uh, to commune with the ancestral spirits. There's even some evidence from residue analysis that that uh, suggests Artemisia, a relative of wormwood. That's the, the thing in absinthe that gets you to see the green fairy might have also been in these beverages. But these aren't beers that they're drinking, or are they? It's a type of millet and rice wine, uh, fermented millet, which is like sorghum. It's a type of grain uh, and, and rice. And so it's, it, but you know, it is a grain, fundamentally it's a fermented grain beverage. So I would call that beer. 
And so they produce it actually through the fermentation of, well, first not malting. They don't malt their grains like you do in the Western world of with working with barley, you malt your grain to get it to, um, to sprout. And then uh, instead though, they use something called the mold sacrification method where they take um, uh, basically a type of fungus and they have that grow all over your steamed grains and that um, it, it induces a uh, it activates certain enzymes that will uh, convert the sugars into uh, or starches into fermentable sugars so it's the same process as malting but instead this is what's the same way that sake is produced and the way soy sauce is produced and such is a very time-honored traditional method in uh, in, in across uh, all of East Asia. Uh, and so that gives that sort of umami slickness to these beverages. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over this a bit myself too, though, but um, having taken a, a jab at trying to produce a, a, a moldy fermented millet and rice beverage. Uh, so you can check that out on my homebrew blog. Uh, and so in addition to the very uh, multi thousand year old uh, story of uh, this kind of um, uh, drinking game or, or basically binge drinking with your ancestral spirits, also a little later on, about a thousand years later, uh, you have another example of a drinking game from ancient China. and. and these are all things that were done mostly with the real elite members of society because that's the, when you get into antiquity, that's what most of the written records are that, that we have is uh, with the elite members of society. And so, uh, but here's a fun pair of screens from the Art Institute's collection. And this shows, uh, don't worry, I have some details here, so don't worry about that. Um, but this shows a, a popular ancient narrative called the Gathering at the Orchid Pavilion, which was a, a, a historical event in the year 353 AD, where you have a bunch of scholars getting together along the uh, banks of a river at the, the so-called Orchid Pavilion. And actually, I'll show in a, a detail here. Of one from one of the two screens in the Art Institute's collection shows a real nice, see how detailed it gets when you zoom in, it's incredible. Uh, but these, this group of scholars come for a day of drinking and, and, and composing poetry and, and um, performing music and such. The men would find these pleasurable spots on the banks of a stream and then servants would fill cups with uh, some type of alcohol, probably this type of uh, 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 millet rice fermented beverage, um, because this is before grape wine was uh, was popular in, in China. And then they'd fill these cups, these dainty little cups and send them downstream, floating them downstream on lotus blossoms. It's so beautiful. And you see a few little uh, young boy servants there with sticks reaching out into the water, trying to pull in these lotus blossoms. Uh, with the with the the rice wine or rice beer on them, uh, and then the idea is so these the, these intellectual literati downstream would be composing poetry, and it was kind of a game that you'd have to compose your poetry quickly, and if you um, were not writing fast enough, then you'd have to take a drink, basically. <laughs> so getting more and more intoxicated as a sort of uh, punishment for, for failure at the game. Um, so there's, and you find often in ancient China, this, this notion, this kind of philosophical, spiritual notion of uh, equating inebriation with uh, artistic creativity. And I mean, we see that too with uh, lots of tragic artists who would choose to um, like uh, Edgar Allan Poe and opium. And so the idea of, and so many of the, the uh, impressionist artists and post-impressionists with their, the green fairy and absinthe. So the idea of, uh, of, of alcohol and, uh, and artistic creativity kind of goes in hand in hand. I love this lovely little 
Speaking of dainty cups, lotus cups, um, uh, this one uh, from a, a few centuries later at the Art Institute uh, is a, a, it's only a three inch tall cup here, but uh, wonderful details of, again, it's a, a cup in the form here now of a lotus. So it's, it's really uh, lovely, re reminiscent of this, this ancient tale. Um, so moving on for our sake of time again, uh, we, hopefully this lovely thing animates. We're going to leave China because we have some more ground to cover in our drinking games and we're making our way over to Renaissance Europe, right? Um, so here we are on our next beverage. Boy, I'm, I'm going to have to catch up with you all. I'm doing so much talking. So um, moving on to our next beverage here is uh, from Old Irving Brewing Company in Chicago. All of the beverages we chose with the exception of the, the Sun and Steel are um, local. Well, that is local to, uh, to the, those of us who are in the Chicago region. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it's great to drink local. Here we are in, in Europe. And even though the style that we have is, uh, is, is only a, a meager 400 years old style, uh, it, so, but that's still, I guess, within Renaissance, um, firmly within the Renaissance period. But I thought we just have to, when we're talking about Europe, we, especially continental Europe, we have to go with a Maybach. So, or also sometimes called a Hellesbach. Uh, so this is a fairly strong beer. The first ones we had were just um, four to 5%. This is more 7% uh, ABV. And also you see the IBUs are a lot higher. So 26 IBUs. So this is, this uh, traditionally would have been considered a very hoppy beer. Now, uh, American craft brewers have just kind of uh, destroyed <laughs> traditional notions of what uh, a high, bitter, hoppy beer is. Um, and uh, But anyway, the Goat Destroyer is a great Maybach. Um, the Munich Hofbräuhaus House claims to have invented this style in 1614, trying to, in Bavaria, so southern Germany, trying to reproduce a style popular in northern Germany from the Einbeck, which is kind of near uh, Goslar, where the Gosa also came from. So, and, and the Hofbräuhaus House claims that the first barrels of Maybach are tapped uh, at the Hofbräuhaus House in the last week of April, just in time for the month of May. The name Maybach means the, the Bach beer of May. And uh, so, so cheers to that. Um, originally, Maybachs were probably a little darker. Here we have a beautiful beautiful amber, a little darker than golden color to this beverage with a real strong, rich, malty backbone to it, but also a bit of a nice bitterness um, with the hops. I'm getting a traditional German noble hops, you get uh, sort of more uh, grassy kind of notes uh, in a sense there. Earlier, uh, it was probably traditionally brewed uh, a lot darker, um, not quite porter or stout dark, but uh, but maybe more of like a German dunkelis, a dark lager. You could still see through it probably, but uh, a hand uh, rule of thumb is that uh, before the Industrial Revolution, uh, uh, most beers were, uh, were were dark, smoky, uh, uh, maybe a little sour from aging in wooden barrels. Um, so, um, but uh, but anyway, that's kind of a bit tongue in cheek. Uh, but everything everything that uh, you kind of don't want in a beer today was what how beers were before. Uh, so, but taking this very good traditional continental European style, we're going to move into some European drinking games here. And one one uh, great drinking game, I'd be so remiss if we didn't touch on this, is called Pass Glass. It's the name of a game and a style of glassware. Glassware is very important. Uh, there's uh, there's a, um, you know, like in, in wine drinking as well, within beer drinking traditionally, you have very distinct styles of glasses that uh, are, you are must pair with certain styles of beer. And uh, so I've tried to do my best with my little taster glasses here, um, but I'm limited with what I have for a taster glass. <laughs> uh, so, but here is a very, very distinctive looking type of glass. You have uh, these, these very, this very tall tapered beaker 
essentially. It kind of looks like a, a, a something you'd find in a science lab um, with, well, the, in the image at left, this stained glass picture it's actually, it's from a private collection, but it hangs in the Art Institute in the medieval and Renaissance galleries. It's, it's fairly small, it's easy to walk by, but it's really beautiful if you spot it. And uh, um, this, uh, there you see the, these fine merchant gentlemen, the glass has some prunts on it, P-R-U-N-T, these, these knobs, these glass knobs, beads basically. Um, the kind of the tongue in cheek uh, idea is that these prunts were, uh, um, meant to keep the glass from slipping out of your hand. You, before the, the, back when you're eating your, your dragon legs and feasts and such, you have these greasy fingers. And so to keep uh, the glassware in your hand would have these prunts. But the one at, at right doesn't have the prunts. Instead, it has the swirl running around it. The, the pass glass, um, different etymologies. Maybe it comes from um, um, uh, an old Dutch word, pass, meaning like a, a measure, like a certain specific measure of quantity, or maybe from an um, old French passer, meaning to pass, like pass from one to another. Uh, probably in German, just kind of a loan word from these one or the other languages. But the pass glass was a game of precision. It was very popular at banquets, weddings, parties, and other kinds of gatherings. Again, these drinking games are, of course, always about these social uh, um, occasions, social gatherings. Very popular style of glass. Well, not very popular, but you will find it in some Dutch golden age still life paintings amidst all of this other splendors here. They could be cylindrical or hexagonal or octagonal. <laughs> it's a few different shapes there, which are lovely. Um, some versions do taper and you find these lines. It can be three to seven horizontal bands. So, but how do you play the game pass glass? What's the point of it? The idea uh, is, well, actually, let me think. I want to um, show you first a couple more and then I'll tell you how to play. <laughs> Just being a little pesky here. A, a beautiful example also in the Art Institute at Center here. Well, these are all from Germany or, or, uh, or the Netherlands from around the late 1600s, early 1700s. This beautiful one in the center here uh, it shows the, the hunt, the rabbit hunt. And what's fun is it's, it's rather subversive. These, these types of glasses in the game pass glass would be played by uh, hunters after their hunting in the woods for a game, they would come back to the lodge and play with their friends, uh, pass glass. Uh, and so in a sense, this kind of subversion, it's like tongue in cheek, a good jab in, 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 your own, in your own side as you're the hunter. And so here you see the hunter with his rifle going towards the rabbits. And then the next rung up, it has the rabbits have, oh no, the rabbits have stolen his sword. <laughs> and now the rabbits have him in, in chase. And then what's the next, um, Next uh, uh, um, uh, rung here, higher. Oh no, the rabbits have caught him. And then lo and behold, they string him up from the gallows. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a cute thing uh, in a sense. So, but how do you pay, play pass glass? So uh, you, the idea is uh, that ostensibly, so you'll fill your beaker, your pass glass with beer, with wine, if you want to be exceptionally adventuresome, maybe with schnapps, but that might just kill you <laughs> that much. And the idea is in a single draught, an uninterrupted single draught, you must drink perfectly to the next line down on the glass. And if you undershoot it or overshoot it, you're forced to drink perfectly to the next line down. So uh, if you're if you're good at it, you drink less. Again, like with the Chinese uh, poetry gathering, if you're bad at it, then you have to drink more. <laughs> Often this, this uh, idea of failure means you have to indulge more, which means you'll just, it's this domino effect of having to indulge more and more. So yeah, fun times in uh, the history of drinking culture. So, and I think we're, we're nearing the end of our time, but we have one last stop to make with just a couple slides, not very far on our final trek from Germany or, or really continental Europe over to England to take a look and open up our, our fourth and final beer here. Yes, thank you very much. And these images that I'm showing, um, it was my, also my 
fun uh, artistic endeavor of creating a nice little photo shoot for all four of these beers for us to drink from. And if you look really close, you'll probably spot a number of the baubles I have amongst these beverages on the back shelf, on the shelf behind me in, in my Zoom <laughs> camera window. So here we go, though, to another great Chicago brewery and a Chicago beer uh, Midwest Coast Brewing Company and ESB, uh, which they call the English sporting beer, but the style ESB stands for extra special bitter, or also known as an English pale ale. This is a, a very uh, a classic English bitter style. And you think, you, you know, this is interesting because in American craft beer culture, we drink all these ultra hop bomb uh, West Coast IPAs and, and the, the, these these juicy New England IPAs. And, and you think, okay, well, everybody keeps saying hops is bitter, but I, this tastes sweet to me. And then years ago, I had my first English pale ale and I realized, okay, that's what they mean when they say hops makes your beer bitter because this has an, a wonderful bitterness to it. It's... Um, It'll wait for it. It's it gets there back on the tongue a little more, <laughs> and a beautiful roasted nose to it. Using um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what kind of roasted malts, uh, some crystal or something. Um, probably a lot of Maris Otter is a very typical English style malt. Maybe it says it on the can, but I won't uh, go investigate that just yet. But uh, so the ales, so this is in, a classic English ale. And then in Germany and continental Europe, we have where lager is king. Lager is like 90 some plus percent of all beer drunk today is, is a lager, especially Pilsner. Uh, but then you have the macro American style lagers um, like uh, Budweiser and, and uh, Miller and so on. Um, and, and all of the pilsners or lagers. It's just a distinction of the different strains and types of yeast that are used to ferment it. And also the temperature at which it ferments. So lagers ferment at refrigeration temperatures, ales ferment at room temperatures. So, um, so yeah, but it, 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 the, the ales tend to also, I mean, it, you, can, you can make an ale taste like a lager, you can make a lager taste like an ale. So you can't really say, oh, ales taste like this, lagers taste like this. Some people like to think that, but, uh, but anyways. <laughs> and so, but our final drinking game here is puzzle jugs and fuddling cups. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but the pictures tell you uh, worth a thousand words here. Uh, uh, puzzle jugs are great things because how on earth are you gonna drink or pour out of these jugs? Jugs that have all these holes in the neck. Um, this uh, this is from the Victoria and Albert Museum. They have a great collection of puzzle jugs and then fuddling cups. Also, these three nested cups. And if all three have beer or wine or liquor in them, it's challenging to drink without pouring on yourself. So a couple of great uh, more puzzle cups here. I love the one at left. This beautiful faux Chinese blue and white wear, Delft wear with this nice open work here. You can really, uh, something you can put your fist right through the wall with the, again, the, the, this, this puzzle of how to drink, how to pour. And I don't know what's going on with this one at right from the Victorian Albert. This is great. This, this uh, rosy cheeked guy and the merman, mermaid at that top and all of that. But you can see the little holes so you cannot effectively drink through it. It, it ends something of a puzzle. They all see you have these holes, these spouts, basically three, three different spouts, sometimes more, but more often three spouts. And you don't pour from these vessels, but rather those spouts serve as straws. One of these straws goes down into the, the beverage and uh, you basically, through suction, you drink your drink out through there. Uh, these hollow walls with a cavity in there. Um, and the trick is you have to find exactly which one of these spouts to suck from because the other two are air holes that might, uh, if that you cannot create a suction if you don't plug the other ones and find the right one to drink through. So it's, it's not a huge game, but it's more of just, if never, no one's ever, if your ne friend has never encountered a puzzle jug and you give one to them, then uh, you just laugh at them a few times until you finally relent and tell them. There's some great phrases on here. Uh, this one at the Metropolitan um, says, uh, where is, what's the, I have it here. Here, gentlemen, come try your skill. 
a holder wager, if you will, that you don't drink this liquor all without you spill or let some fall. Lots of fun little rhyming couplets and such on puzzle jugs. Another one here is, uh, let me find a, a fun one. It says that, uh, fill me with ale, with wine or water, any of the three, it makes no matter. Drink me dry if you're willing. In doing so, you'll win a shilling. <laughs> And then lastly, fuddling cups. Uh, it's another just trick kind of game of having to figure out how to drink from it, how to hold it, which, uh, which of the cups you should drink first. You see in the, uh, this top photo from the one from Dallas has a little hole. So the three cups are interconnected. If you fill one, it spills into the others. And so then you just have to know the exact way to hold it so it doesn't spill on you as you're drinking it. And you might have to twist and turn as you drain them slowly and, and, and flow your beverage from one side to another and then hold it up to your mouth. And you see the one at right uh, is, a, is a nice puzzle to boot with uh, six, six instead of three. So lots of fun. And our final slide, long and the short, all these kind of trick cups, gags, and gamification of drinking hinges on drinking as this aspect of community bonding. And so going back again also to beer as this cultural force that uh, brings people together uh, with the ability to have fun as well as influence change sometimes. And it's a, a as deep aspect, this whole term of drinking culture. It's a, a form of cultural expression through the types of drinkware and, uh, and, and the types of camaraderie that are built around uh, all of this. So um, thanks, I'm sorry we had to rush a little bit at the end there, but uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm certainly happy to, I know we had a few questions in there and I've not been terribly great at keeping track of them, but. Uh, <laughs> That's what I'm here for, Lucas. Fantastic, I appreciate it. No worries. <laughs> we did have a couple of questions come in, um, so we will go in the order that they were received, but I will say for folks who still have questions, you can feel free to raise your hand, not your physical hand, your Zoom hand. Just keep in mind, we are recording this. So if you choose to raise your hand and I unmute you, your voice will be recorded. So if you don't want that, go ahead and uh, pop your questions into the chat. But the first question we had was, uh, was there ever a time in history when cheese was added as a fermenting agent? Oh yeah. Uh... Good question there. Let me think about that. So, well, um, I think uh, not, not that I immediately can, can think of, uh, and I'm just wondering uh, in terms of adding cheese to your uh, beverage, what it would do. Sometimes actually along a similar lines, the idea of uh, kind of a, a fermented milk, uh, sometimes um, yogurt of sorts might be added to uh, a, a batch of something to kind of inoculate it and kickstart a fermentation. But there's two different types of fermentation and the type of fermentation that you would do with um, sauerkraut and and um, soy sauce and and cheese uh, that's a different type that's non-alcoholic fermentation versus the type of fermentation to produce an alcoholic beverage it's a matter of yeah difference of uh, bacteria converting uh, um, the, the 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 starches into acids or sugars into acids versus uh, yeast converting sugars into alcohol yeah long in the short there <laughs> i don't it doesn't really answer the question but uh, yeah no, and I think of yogurt and alcohol, and it, it grosses me out a little bit. But I, I feel like somebody must have liked it, right? Because yeah. Well, we didn't, and um, we didn't even talk about um, Mongolian fermented milk, which is a yeah. thing. Uh, I don't know any drinking games around that, but uh, it's still a, a popular beverage in uh, Mongolia today called Irag or Kumis is more what it's called in like uh, where further to the West, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. And then another question came in. I, I love this question. Were there orgies simultaneous with the drinking games? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Orgies with the drinking games. I mean, for sure. There, well, orgies, what, what are we going to consider an orgy? I mean, we look at the, uh, 
we look at the symposium and uh, we see, I think on this slide here, there's, there's definitely in the bottom slide, there's, there's these uh, men and women carousing and such. Uh, and uh, with, while perhaps playing uh, their, their drinking games. So yeah, they, they go, they go hand in hand uh, to an extent. And then another fun thing we saw on this slide was uh, after your symposium, when you're when you're all drunk, <laughs> then uh, one popular thing to do was called a comos, K-O-M-O-S, which was basically a um, a, a, a pub crawl <laughs> where in the middle of the night all these drunken symposiasts would go out into the streets, uh, um, processing through the streets, shouting out, throwing up, uh, and uh, and and I don't know ultimately what their destination was, but uh, but yeah. <laughs> That's excellent. And Rebecca does have a question. So Rebecca, I'm going to allow you to talk. So I'm, you should be able to unmute yourself now and ask your question. Oh, actually, can, can you hear me? We can, yes. Oh, um, yeah, I did have another question. I'm wondering if Professor Lucas could um, say something about the relationship to, for, of cider to beer. Okay, okay, the relationship of cider to beer. Yeah, sure. Very similar. Yes. Similar process, of course. Um, but yeah, and, and cider was, uh, well, and uh, you know, people ask, well, what, what, what came first, uh, wine or beer? And my answer is neither, probably more mead or other, um, uh, or in a sense, cider could too, and other types of fruits where um, they just want to become alcoholic. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, yeah, cider was extremely popular, uh, certainly in, in, in America, actually, like colonial and early United States, cider was exceptionally popular as a drink. Uh, its relationship to beer, and it's hard to say in a nutshell, uh, to define that, that uh, as far as a relationship there. Uh, so, but in a, in a sense, people worked with what type of mm, sugar source was readily available to them wherever they are. And we see, again, going back even to Mongolia, they don't have apple orchards or pastures, farms of barley to malt to turn into alcohol uh, or ample rice or such, but rather what they have is, is milk. And if you don't think about it, but there actually is some sugar in milk, especially horse milk has much more sugar than cow's milk and, and sheep's milk. And so horse milk will ferment if you let it go. And so people are bound and determined to, um, to basically take whatever they have at their available and turn it into alcohol, you know? Yeah. I love this. This really speaks to human industriousness. Like they will go to any length Absolutely. to turn something into alcohol. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? I don't see any other hands raised. Nothing in the chat. Megan, do you see, am I missing? Oh, wait, hold on. So were these drinking games a regular weekly thing? Yeah, how it's hard to say how often they would occur. And um, of course, we tackled so many different cultures here. Um, yeah, I'm curious. I don't, I don't, that's an interesting question. I don't know offhand how often people would gather for like, say, the symposium, for example. It might be attested in some some source somewhere, um, but uh, but yeah, you know that's uh, it's certainly. I think a lot of drinking games would happen almost daily or nightly, and um, that is probably to some extent. I mean, evidenced by uh, well, what what led ultimately to the temperance movement? Too much time uh, with um, men of the household wasting their time and money in, the, uh, in, in uh, taverns and then uh, blowing the fail of the one's paycheck and then coming home and uh, not doing right by your family. So, so yeah, probably uh, the, uh, these were nightly affairs in, in, in some times and places, yeah. Excellent, and were there age limits for the drinking games or just for drinking in general? What was that like in ancient times? 
Well, you know, that's a, a kind of a fun rule of thumb. And when you talk about an antiquity, we get this, we all often will say this kind of uh, tongue in cheek thing that, well, beer is safer to drink than the water back in the day. Uh, that's, I mean, that's, that's a little disingenuous because people were drinking water back then. And, and you do find times when, of course, yeah, I, there's when was the I don't remember the date offhand, but in the 1700s, there's a great cholera outbreak in London. And the, there was within this whole neighborhood where the cholera outbreak was happening, there's one building where there was no cholera. And that happened to be the brewery <laughs> because they were drinking the beer, not the infected water from the pump. Uh, and so, yeah, so boiling the beverage and even a low level of alcohol, it will kill a lot of pathogens. Uh, and so kids too would drink as well, very low alcoholic beverages. You have uh, some passages, even, even as recent as in some of the writings of uh, Jane Austen, she makes some passing references to, uh, to kids drinking small beer. Um, so a very low alcohol, simple table beer, a couple percent or so. Yeah, yeah. So it's a uh, so right age limits no no not so much uh, but most of these drinking games as we've seen were uh yeah regrettably with most of the high culture and literary evidence uh, and, and archaeological evidence coming from uh, the ancient world is very much yeah kind of a, a male dominated um, aspects of society and culture yeah and elites not just not just men but the, the wealthiest of the wealthy yeah yeah. Well, and since you bring up um, men, Lucas, I think for our, our final question for tonight, I, I'm curious, were women allowed to participate in drinking game or was it only certain classes of women, certain types of women or all women? Right, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm racking my brain trying to figure out what types of drinking games might have been accessible to women other than uh, other than, of course, courtesans, yeah, which is a fancy word for prostitutes, right? Uh, and yeah, nothing is jumping to my mind <laughs> uh, because, yeah, even until even up until uh, as as recent as uh, prohibition, which this year actually we're celebrating uh, the, the this is the one hundredth uh, anniversary of the institution of, of prohibition in, in the United States, the Volstead Act. Um, so is that right? Yeah, that was, uh, that was um, uh, 1921. So uh, until that point, really, uh, bars were essentially off limits to, to women. I mean, we have though, interestingly, actually coming back from a, in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, and even in medieval Europe, you have, and, and well, even as, even as late as getting them into the late medieval, early Renaissance, you definitely you do have women brewers and tavern keepers. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and so, and that was one of the few types of careers or, or jobs that would be available to, uh, especially to independent women, women who were widowed or non-married, um, that they could take a brew beer uh, or even married women to supplement their income. Uh, and so that was one of the few, uh, res few respectable jobs for women to have um, for, throughout much of, of time. Um, yeah, and then really you kind of see all over the world until uh, as soon as people discovered that it was a, it could become a very lucrative and more industrial scale business, as soon as that's figured out, then the men take it away from the women, basically. Yeah. But we're definitely seeing a resurgence in the craft beer movement uh, and, and uh, even in the macro um, uh, in scale of, uh, yeah, a strong movement of women um, the, the support for women in the in the as brewers as owners of breweries um, pioneers in the brewing industry so it's yeah it's it's great coming full circle uh, women invented alcohol invented brewing and beer so and and yeah they're taking it back <laughs> that's awesome I love to hear that <laughs> um, well this is it's time I'm sad to say but thank you everyone for joining us tonight and a huge thank you to Lugas 
Lucas, sorry, excuse me, for being so generous with your time and giving us a ton of really cool information. And I just have a bunch of cool facts just sitting in the back of my head ready for the next like party that I go to and can just whip them out and sound really cool. Um, but as I mentioned before, um, once you leave the program, um, you will be directed to a survey and we greatly appreciate any and all feedback as it helps us plan our future programming. Um, we will also be sending a follow-up email with Lucas's slides and um, other fun upcoming events suggestions. And on that note, thank you everyone. Thank you very much. Um, and we will see you in the future. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks Take care everybody. Thanks Allison, thanks Megan. Thanks Lucas. Thanks everybody.